Hello, welcome to News Click. You are watching Present, Past and the Future and I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay. Twice a year, the Republic Day and the Independence Day are occasions when we are coaxed to flaunt our nationalism or patriotism by buying flags which are being sold in various red light junctions in different cities across the country. About 250 years ago, a very important scholar had said that patriotism is the refuge of scoundrels. In the contemporary world, especially in India, we might as well say that nationalism has become the last refuge of paranoid politicians. Why do I say it? Since 2014, nationalism has become some kind of a favorite tick of this particular regime that we are uh, under in this country. Every time that there is a crisis or a challenge, the word nationalism is flaunted and anybody who disagrees with their version of nationalism is painted as an anti-national or as somebody who is working against national interests. This is not the first time that it is being done in India. Almost 35 years ago, Indira Gandhi used to constantly warn people about the foreign hand whenever her regime was being challenged and toppled for various uh, indiscretions of her own government. So we do have a past where insecure leaders invoke the nationalist spirit to strengthen themselves to gain for greater support. But this has become much more serious in the last few years, especially because it is increasingly being also used as an electoral strategy. Now to discuss this very important question, especially at a time when we are getting into the election season, when it is fairly certain that the spirit of nationalism is going to be denigrated and is going to be misused. I would uh, like to talk about this and for this I have invited Sukumar Mulidharan, a very senior journalist who is also currently teaching journalism in the Jindal University. Sukumar, welcome to the program. Uh, my first uh, question to you, if I can actually put a question, is that right from the beginning we have had two strands of ideas as to how we define nationalism, right from for almost more than 100 years in India from the time we had the freedom struggle going on. On one hand, you had an inclusive government, uh, inclusive nationalism, which was articulated by the Congress and by several others who were a part of the mainstream nationalist movement. And on the other side, you had a sectarian or a non-inclusive kind of a, a nationalism, also called Hindu nationalism. Basically, the, me, uh, the point being that different kind of premises as to what kind of India, what is our kind of India, idea of India as we say it, that determined as to different forms of nationalism. It is continuing even today. We see it for the last five years under this present regime. That's right. Although I would disagree whether the, the inclusive form of nationalism was the exclusive property of the Congress, there were other strands also there definitely articulated others. that. And there were sectarian elements within the Congress also. But yes, nationalism is a distinctly modern idea and uh, you know, people try to reach back to distant recesses of history to discover the origins of nationalism are essentially on a futile quest or, or creating an artificial kind of sense of solidarity when it didn't exist. Nationalism is very much uh, an artifact of modernization and industrial society. And uh, I think these begin in India in the late 19th century and there were two strands, as you say. There was one which was early on, it was difficult to, to um, articulate a kind of civic bond between Indians of all faiths and communal uh, leanings. So there was a talk, an elite kind of nationalism, which said that the educated Indian strata has proved itself deserving of equal citizenship in the British Empire. Mm. And there was the other, which was associated with the firebrands like uh, Tilak, Lokman Tilak and others, 
which spoke of, of revivalism of ancient cultures right. of Hinduism and, and it the was, Vedic it civilization. Revi and so revivalism on. which Tilak articulated, that is what eventually gave the inspiration for what became the Hindu nationalistic That's thought. right, yes. He, so he is left a very he, strong yeah, kind of bequest definitely. in terms of the Hindu nationalist uh, stream. And uh, of course, the uh, other stream also, the, these were continuously in contention. And of course, the Hindu na revivalist uh, stream of thought also triggered an equal and opposite reaction of Islamic revivalism. Right. And there was a severe kind of contest between these in terms of capturing numbers because numbers suddenly came to be seen as key to political success. Mm. And with the census that the British started during the colonial times, it was very important to prove that you, you know, had numbers so that you could stake a claim to political but power. But if you're talking in terms of an ideology, the ideology of nationalism, you know, let's not look at the various streams. But uh, under the colonial uh, era, uh, nationalism had one kind of meaning. That's right. But post post independence, so that comes nationalism about. had to evolve as an idea and not be used as a very dogmatic ideology, which is what it is. That it comes about over time. It's a, there's a slow process of evolution, which uh, of course you have uh, uh, Tagore. Rabindra Tagore during World War I articulating a very serious kind of opposition to nationalism as an ideology right. because he sees the carnage of World War I all around him and sees that this is the consequence of nationalism which pits man against man, right. community against community. And there's a long debate between Gandhi and mm -hmm. Tagore over how Indian, future Indian polity should be organized. But from about 1929 you have a, what is a sense of civic equality being seen as a foundation of nationalism and key points in that evolution in 1929, the, the Purna Swaraj right. resolution mm -hmm. of the Indian National Congress, which adopted Purna Swaraj as the objective. Of the objective. So, you know, because still then there had been a lot of wavering between dominion status of Purna Swaraj exactly. and so on and so forth. So, 1929 under that the... you had a clear cut in 1929, you had a clear cut objective to right. so what you were trying to get to. With the leadership of Pandit Nehru and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and so on, the man Congress finally committed itself yeah. to Purna Swaraj. In 1931, in the, um, in the Karachi Congress, hmm. the resolution spoke of uh, nationalism based on civic equality of all citizens, religious neutrality. That's right. There will be no kind of, there will be a strict separation of church and state, hmm. and a welfare orientation which would promote the well-being of all citizens, including the poorest, with a special kind of emphasis on welfare. So that 1931 Karachi resolution is a resolution of historic significance. And uh, I think that essentially was the, was a template for post-independence India. We, of course, didn't settle the but issue that, there. That's also the period when the template of the other strand, the Hindu nationalist strand, is also set up. That's, that's also right. the time Absolutely. by which yes. the RSS has been formed. So, the RSS is actually in a quandary, uh, Hedgevar is in a quandary at that time, especially after Poon Swaraj, as to whether to support it, also whether to celebrate uh, uh, January 26 as uh, the exactly. national uh, yes. uh, you know, celebration day. Uh, it also uh, forces the RSS to agree to allow its cadre to participate in uh, the civil disobedience movement, but as individuals, not as an organization. So the contradictions really starts coming in. Let me also just uh, read out, uh, you know, not just, I'm sure that you would know, but also for the benefit of our readers, you know, what Nehru wrote in the Dis Discovery of India. He said that, I am convinced nationalism can only come out of the ideological fusion of Hindu, Muslim, Sikh and other groups in India. That does not mean that extinction of any real culture of any group, but it does mean a common national outlook to which other matters are subordinated, or to which other matters are subordinated. So definitely, he is talking about a fusion, you know, something which is against the idea of this particular regime, against the Sankh Parivar, which uh, this government represents, the ideology of Hindu nationalism, which was first articulated by Savarkar, and then later on worked upon by various other ideologues of the movement. Yes, indeed. There's, uh, there's, uh, there are two kinds of uh, attitudes here again. There's one which speaks about an exclusion of all religion right. and faith from the public sphere, so that you're essentially talking about privatization of all faiths. And there's another one which says that, okay, allow all faiths equal opportunity in the public sphere. And if you have 
that foundation of civic equality, they can all have their say and you can achieve a kind of higher synthesis of all these, all these faiths which will get you, get you a, a kind of syncretic national identity that reflects the complexities of our history. Uh, so those were continuously in play. They, they emerge even during the Constituent Assembly debates and there are people who articulate the former but, viewpoint but in the last of strict exclusion and there are people who articulate the latter viewpoint but of this is, this equal But this has become much more respect. sharp and much more crystallized in the last uh, three decades since the emergence of the uh, of the Ram Janam Bhumi movement, you know, really if we try to put it as a watershed, that's a time when the nature of Indian political discourse starts change, changing and there is greater acceptance for the Hindu nationalistic idea. It did, uh, you know, be in, you know, as a contested idea for a long period of time, but in the last 10 years or so, there is a greater amount of an acceptance of the ideology of Hindu nationalism, you know, you find various other political parties also, even the Congress, we talk about but, soft Hindu But ideology. if you consider this very carefully, you'll find that it has a shifting constituency. There are different elements which sign up for that ideology from one election to another. And the key aspect of the Hindu nationalist Hindutva coalition, if you might call it that today, is the large scale entry of OBCs who used to be outside That's that right. consolidation at one time. You also have Earlier, the, you, it used you, to be you, very much you, an upper You also have the non-dominant uh, subcasts among the Dalits Correct. who are who are the exactly. new exactly. So, so you so have they, a very conscious strategy. So they have managed to put together a social coalition based on these calculations right. of what ensures best electoral success. So in a sense, they're playing upon short-term resentments that certain sections may feel at their exclusion from the from the ruling arrangement like for instance in UP they have taken they were recruited the non Jatav Dalits right. because Jatavs achieved no, a lot of power OBCs, under oh, even among the OBCs you have the non Yadav, non -yadav, exactly. non -yadav you so, know, they yeah, earlier exactly. did it this is the same strategy so, so they Nitish have, Kumar did they have in Bihar previously. welded this constituency along with the traditional high upper caste constituencies to create this coalition whether well, that's stable and how, how far they can hold that constituency together, that coalition together from one election to another is still debatable, still remains unproven. If you look at the evidence of the recent assembly elections in Rajasthan, mm. uh, Madhya Pradesh, no, even Gujarat, even they Gujarat. Defi there definitely has been an erosion from the yep. levels, the, the vote levels which the, the party had in 2014 and even in 2017, especially in Uttar Pradesh or in other Absolutely the right. assembly elections, yes. you know, there has been a If you look at the by-elections in Uttar Pradesh. But the point instance. is that if we actually try to plot an imaginary index, index of Hindutva, you know, go back and look at the 80s and bring it now, we'll find that the index of Hindutva has been rising slowly. There are periods, you know, when there's a slump, but that does not mean that it is dying out. So it definitely has emerged as a dominant, uh, you know, you know uh, ideology in the country and it is it is well, acquiring it is uh, dom, you know uh, it has a huge amount of space in the public discourse well what has changed is that the congress leadership has uh, kind of uh, retreated from its very commitment commi commitment to, to oppose the uh, to Hindu oppose Dutra. yeah the and not just the congress it's not just the 80s the 1960s also there was a strong yeah. revivalist exactly. movement when the congress coalition was under some stress and they had successive electoral setbacks in 1967, 68, 69. You know, we are, we are, what we are seeing in the way in which nationalism is being used as a stick to beat the adversary with, you know, we are talking also about the JNU charge sheet which has been filed very recently. The idea being, you know, this entire thing campaign against the so-called Tukde Tukde gang. The idea is that opposition to the government is also opposition to the nation. You know, if you are questioning government policy or anything, be it on the issues of minorities, be it on the issues of deprived communities or different neglect of regions, be it Kashmir or be it in Chhattisgarh or various places, you know, where you have people's movements going on of different kinds, if you're questioning it, then it means that you are against the nation. So what is happening is that you have a very singular idea of nation. And this is not happening only in India. Very recently, the French president Macon, you know, while celebrating the, the the centenary of the First World War, talked about that it was universal ideas which motivated the soldiers and not a narrow parochial nationalism which might have motivated or, or rather, you know, what Donald Trump would want to present that it occasion, you know, to, to celebrate uh, American nationalism. So it is a part of a global trend. Well, there are uh, global determinants for this in the sense of the increasing turbulence, the kind of globalization which has eroded a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. True. There are flows of manpower, there are flows of capital which nobody can control. Your lives are being increasingly determined by the rhythms of 
international capital flows, which very few, few people understand. So a sense of loss of control that citizens all over the world are feeling. And this is a kind of response to that, a reaction to that, which is taking it along a direction which, in which the hazards are more, because you're going to get into more and more of insularity and uh, fail to see that the solutions lie in common pursuits, common endeavors mm. across borders. So you, so you're retreating into these national borders and creating artificial kinds of antagonisms within these borders and uh, seeking a solution by, by disentitling certain people. Some certain categories of citizens are now being disempowered. Uh, if you see this kind of... So uh, beyond that, you know, this other problem is that especially in India, what we are seeing is that there is a very consistent use of hate. Yes, exactly. And that is a prelude to the actual disenfranchisement of people, the disempowerment of people, because when you have this kind of a campaign directed against certain categories of citizens, uh, basically saying that they are not deserving, deserving of civic equality and they are not deserving of citizens' rights, mm. that's the first stage towards an act of disempowerment in terms of you know, the constitutional rights. So that is a danger that we are seeing all over the world. Every, everywhere, mm. the new nationalism is built upon a uh, definition of the other, which is threatening the security of those who are truly deserving. So in India, it is the illegal migrant, which is a kind of, it's a kind of uh, 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 coded reference to a certain religious faith, because everybody from that faith is regarded in some sense and as And you can see the conflict undeserved. coming up over the citizen bill, you know, citizenship exactly, bill. Exactly, exactly. Which is there is a And the imposition of the bill. other criterion for availing of certain citizens' entitlements. Now that cuts across the religious fault lines and potentially disempowers large sections of our Dalits and the tribal communities also. So, so there are all these kinds of stratagems at play which, uh, which mean that we're moving further and further away from an inclusive how nationalism this, based on civic how equality. How can this be countered because the mainstream political parties, those, even those who are in opposition to the dominant political force of today, uh, they are not willing to tackle it ideologically for pragmatic electoral reasons. We saw that, you know, as to how very important minority-related issues were not articulated by the Congress in Madhya Pradesh and in Rajasthan. Last year, we saw that even uh, in Gujarat, they were not raised issues which are critical, not just to minorities, but to the secular fabric of this country, do not get raised. There is a general kind of sense that uh, we should not be seen to be stating too much for the minorities. Sonia Gandhi made a public speech last year in which she, she said that unfortunately the Congress has got the image of being a pro-Muslim pro party. So there is a conscious attempt to move away from uh, a commitment to safeguarding minorities' status in this country. Which is, uh, which is uh, probably the most unfortunate thing that's happened since uh, independence because uh, so far we have, at least the Congress has chosen never to adopt that idiom of uh, political discourse of identifying people by religion and uh, targeting particular people on the basis of their faith. Now that they have, uh, you have to really wonder if this rightward shift of the political center of gravity is going to finally culminate in the disempowerment and disenfranchisement of entire sections of people. But uh, what I do believe is that the political costs of this will prove more than they can bear at some point. Because you cannot have too accurate a targeting of people based on religious faith alone. It becomes a process by which, along with this category of people, you begin to exclude others also from other social strata, from other social sections. Mm -hmm. And then you create a potential for consolidation of those who are threatened by exclusion, who could exercise their franchise and reassert some of their electoral strength and then regain some of the ground that they're losing. So it's a complex game and uh, I don't think there's uh, any, uh, any uh, party which is willing to risk the entire loss of say 13% of the national electoral constituency, natural electoral vote, mm. which is people of the Muslim faith, mm. 
except for the BJP. The BJP is BJP has built a strategy. BJP, BJP, BJP strategy, has built a strategy on excluding them altogether. BJP strategy is what we yeah. call reverse polarization. Right. That that you try to to you do not you target the Muslims so that you can go back to the Hindus In and say Uttar that. In Uttar Pradesh, they had a clear strategy of what is called 60 to 40 because they identified 40 percent of the population as people who would be averse to their appeal. Mm -hmm. That includes the Muslims, the Yadavs, and the Jatavs, and right. a few others uh, uh, who are aligned with these categories. So the other 60 percent is where they directed their entire right. focus, their entire attention, and they managed so to even, win a substantial if, number of Even after the BSP and the SP coming together, if you speak to leaders of the BSP and the SP individually, they do confess that there is actually no certainty that they're uh, loyal voter base is going to remain with them and not get swayed away by a last-minute Hindu, uh, you know, you know, you know, wave in favor of uh, the BJP. Their worry is that uh, that there may be certain kind of reasons, you know, as to what hap happened in 2013-14. You had a criminal riot in Muzaffarnagar, and then that, that impacted yeah. the elections all over the country. Those kind of events can sway voter loyalty at the last minute, but uh, finally. I think they will make a calculation about how far will this particular political formation safeguard my interests in the next five years. So, so that they are, I think, better aware of than most parties give them credit for. I think uh, they will make that decision uh, based on a fairly sound uh, so calculation. To so to counter it, you know, do you think that there is a necessity to point out, you know, that uh, their national version of nationalism is different from the kind of patriotism which should be encouraged and allowed to thrive in this country. How can it be argued at them? Well, yes, patriotism and nationalism, there have been uh, periods in history when these have been in contest. Mm. Uh, patriotism, the origin of the term is uh, in, the, in the Latin patri. Patri is also a common root for patrimony. So mm. there was a notion that only people who have a stake in the land, mm. the owners of the land, are capable of patriotism. You know, patrimony being property. Right. So, so there was a disenfranchisement of all those who were who labored on the land but didn't have ownership interest in the land. Mm. So, nationalism became at some point a popular form of mobilization in, by which they managed to recruit even these people without property into the into the common shared political quest. So in India, again, you could say Tagore was not a nationalist, yeah. but he was a patriot in he the sense patriot. that he believed that everybody so, should so, have a stake so, in the in the. So I, I think, you know, on that note, that it's possibly time for us to go back to the kind of patriotism which was articulated by people like Tagore to go back and say that that is patriotism and this false nationalism which we are pursuing and which is... Tagore and Gandhi in his own way. Yes, it Gandhi is. And many yep. several others also. Let us Ambedkar, not just... Ambedkar, just, Ambedkar just, also just had his own specific understanding so, of this. So, uh, a kind of patriotism or a kind of nationalism which is not unitary, which is not inward looking, is the kind of idea which we should go back. Thank you, Sukuma, for coming and joining me on this particular program. And thank you for watching. We just hope that we do not really become a people, you know, who start living in very small boxes and instead of being a great nation, we become a nation of very small people. Thank you very much for watching this.